Hello, everyone. Welcome back. We are on chapter 13 of Materials Kinetics, which is devoted to kinetics of phase separation. Um, up to this point, most of the diffusion problems that we have studied uh, have been following Fickian diffusion, which is diffusion down a concentration gradient. And phase separation is a case where a concentration gradient can be created where there isn't one initially. In other words, we can have diffusion that acts upward, up a concentration gradient. So today we are going to understand uh, the thermodynamics of what is driving phase separation and then derive the kinetic equations that describe how phase separation evolves. So the outline for today is, uh, of course, as we always do, we start with thermodynamics because thermodynamics is what provides the driving force for kinetic processes to occur. Uh, we're going to deal with the case specifically of liquid immiscibility. So this is an unmixing of liquids. We're going to consider two different types of phase separation that can occur, phase separation by droplet nucleation and phase separation by spinodal decomposition. And after setting up all of this thermodynamics, we are going to get into the kinetics of phase separation. We will be deriving the kahn hilliard equation. And then I'm going to show you an example of using it, which is the field of phase field modeling. So let's get started with the thermodynamics of mixing. Uh, suppose that you have two jars that contain two different types of atoms. One jar contains a bunch of atoms of type A, and the other jar contains a bunch of atoms of type B. Uh, now, if you are at some temperature T and pressure P, uh, we're going to mix them together. So, so take your jar of A, mix it together with your jar of B, um, what happens to those atoms? The, there are three options for the system. They could stay unmixed. In other words, they could remain no more than a physical mixture. For example, if you try to mix uh, oil and water, they completely phase separate because the water uh, wants to bond with other water molecules. The oil wants to bond with other oil molecules, and they really um, do not prefer to mix at all. Um, so the first option is to remain unmixed. Uh, the second option is to mix on an atomic scale and form a complete solution. So if you get a complete homogeneous mixture of A and B. The third option then is to mix in preferential ratios to form various compounds of A and B. So this would be a partial unmixing. And we'll see how all three of these options can occur based on their underlying thermodynamics. Mm -hmm. Um, so here's the setup for the problem. Before mixing, we have a certain concentration of the A species here. And let's denote that concentration as 1 minus C. And then the remainder of the system is our concentration C here of our B types of atoms. So two different types of atoms, A and B. The concentration of the species B is denoted as C. And therefore, 1 minus C is the mole fraction of species A. Now, if we have an unmixed system, the total free energy of the unmixed system is just the free energy of the subsystem A plus the free energy of the subsystem B. So the free energy of the subsystem B is just the concentration of B, C, times the Gibbs free energy of that homogeneous phase B. Uh, likewise, the Gibbs free energy of A is just its concentration, which is 1 minus C, times the Gibbs free energy of that phase A. And so if you take those two subsystems, add up their free energies, that gives you the total free energy of the unmixed system, which is denoted here as G1. Now, if we take these two um, jars here of A and B, and we mix them together, uh, the free energy in the mixed case is given by G2, and that is usually expressed relative to the free energy of the unmixed case. So G2 equals G1, the free energy of the unmixed system, plus then some change of free energy due to mixing. This delta G sub M is the change of free energy due to mixing. And if this is positive, if that's positive, that means that there's a free energy penalty to mixing, which means it's thermodynamically unfavorable for the system to mix. And in that case, the system will remain phase separated. This is like trying to mix together water and oil. 
Uh, on the other hand, if the free energy of mixing is negative for some range of compositions, then uh, some degree of mixing will take place in that range. And we'll see exactly how that works uh, later on in this lecture. What we need to do next, um, as always, is to consider that the free energy uh, is composed of two different terms. So our Gibbs free energy of mixing has an enthalpy of mixing, this delta H sub M. This relates to uh, the different types of bonding that would occur in the unmixed or the mixed systems, and whether there is an, an enthalpy penalty associated with bonding in the mixed case or not. And then the second term is our entropic term, minus T, the absolute temperature, times the entropy of mixing, delta S sub M. Now, this entropy of mixing for a either an ideal two-component solution or a regular solution, uh, this entropy of mixing is just given by minus the gas constant here, R, times then the concentration of one species times the natural log of that concentration plus the concentration of the other species times the natural log of that concentration. These natural logs are going to be negative because they are numbers between zero and one, and they're going to multiply by the minus sign here so that the entropy of mixing is always a positive number. Therefore, if you put this positive entropy of mixing here in the Gibbs free energy equation, we know that the temperature is also always a positive number. And so with the minus side out in front here, that means this entropy term always has a negative contribution to the Gibbs free energy of mixing. So this is always moving in the favorable direction. Um, so from an entropic point of view, mixing is always favored. And that's because the entropy of the system always increases upon mixing. Now, there are three different types of solutions that we can consider. The simplest case is an ideal solution. This would be like, for example, a solution of noble gases that don't interact with each other. Uh, in that case, since there's no bonding, there's no interaction between species, the enthalpy of mixing is zero. So for an ideal solution, the Gibbs free energy of mixing is entirely dominated by the entropic term. And because entropy always favors mixing, that means for an ideal solution, the mixing will always occur. You always get a complete atomic mixture um, following this formula shown here. Now, the more interesting case is for regular solutions. With regular solutions, the entropy of mixing follows the formula that we already indicated, uh, but the enthalpy of mixing is non-zero. We could have a positive or a negative enthalpy of mixing, but this is just indicating that there's some sort of change of the bonding in the mixture compared to the unmixed case, um, and that may be enthalpically favorable or unfavorable. And this therefore sets up a competition between the enthalpy of mixing and the entropy of mixing and whether or not a system will mix depend, will depend on um, the sign of the enthalpy of mixing and also the balance between the enthalpic and the entropic terms. Um, a more complicated case would be a non-regular solution. With a non-regular solution, the enthalpy of mixing is non-zero uh, and the entropy of mixing is not symmetric about C equals one half. Um, but for the purposes of this lecture, we're going to stick with regular solutions here. And in the context of this regular solution model, um, one of the simple forms for describing this enthalpy of mixing is shown by the formula here, where this alpha is the excess interaction energy. So this is a comparison of the bond energies uh, of the bonding between unlike species compared to the average of the bonding between like species. So for example, if you have an unmixed case of, of just A atoms and just B atoms, in that case, all the A atoms would be bonded to other A atoms. All the B atoms would be bonded to other B atoms. And then there's some average bond energy of the phase separated A phase and the B phase. Now we need to compare that to the bond energy of the mixed case. So compare the average a bond energy of like species to the bond energy of unlike species here, E, A sub B. And the question becomes, is it more energetically favorable here um, to have bonding between A and B or between the like species? 
And um, if this overall quantity here is negative, that means that we have a negative enthalpy of mixing. And that means that uh, the bonding between unlike species is favorable because it gives us a more negative bond energy. On the other hand, if the alpha value is positive, that means on average that the bonding between like species is preferred. That means from an enthalpic point of view, uh, the system would, or each atom would rather be bonded to its own type of atom rather than to the opposite type of atom. So this alpha here is telling us both um, the sign of whether or not bonding between like species or, or unlike species is preferred, and the magnitude of alpha tells us how much different the bond energy is in those particular cases. The um, multiplicative factors here, C times 1 minus C, is um, just kind of the balance between how much is going to be um, how much mixture is possible based on the relative mixing of A and B. Of course, the greatest amount of bonding between A and B would be possible if C equals one half, if you have an exact 50-50 um, you know, split between the A atoms and the B atoms. Uh, note that this is symmetric about C equals one half, just like the entropy is symmetric about C equals one half. The difference is that the functional form of the of entropy is different. This has uh, natural logarithms in it, um, and this is just a um, multiplication of C times one minus C times this alpha factor. So they're both symmetric about one half, but they have slightly different shapes based on their different functional forms. So the easier case to consider here um, is on the left. Uh, consider if we have a regular solution where the enthalpy of mixing is negative. If the enthalpy of mixing is negative, um, this is an exothermic reaction when those species are mixed. That means that it's giving off heat as the mixture occurs. And this means that the bonding between unlike species is favorable. So from an enthalpy point of view, the enthalpy is lowering the Gibbs free energy. So enthalpy favors mixing. Entropy always favors mixing. So both the enthalpy and the entropy are acting in the same direction. Both the enthalpy and the entropy agree that they both want the mixing to occur. If you add up these two curves together, you get this Gibbs free energy of mixing. And this is a function of the concentration of the different species here. So this x-axis is going from zero. At zero, we've got um, the phase A and all the way up to one where we have phase B. And anything that's between zero and one is a mixture of the two. And for all of those mixtures, there's a negative enthalpy of mixing. The entropic term also comes in as negative. And so the Gibbs free energy of mixing is negative across that entire range. So this is always going to favor uh, a complete mixture of A and B, a complete mixture at the atomic level. Now, the more interesting case comes when there's a competition between the enthalpy of mixing and the entropy of mixing. So if we change the sign of the enthalpy of mixing, if delta H sub M is positive, this means that the mixing is endothermic rather than exothermic. In other words, it's taking in heat from the surroundings um, as the, the mixture is, as the mixing is happen, happening. In this case, enthalpy says, I don't want to mix. Enthalpy, from a, a pure bond energy point of view, um, the two phases prefer to remain separated. However, Entropy always favors mixing. So what determines what wins here between the enthalpy of mixing, which says I don't want to mix, and the entropy of mixing, which says I do want to mix? Um, that balance between the two is really determined by the temperature of the system. If the temperature is high, that means that this T factor out in front of the entropy is large. So this is going to favor entropy. And that's exactly the case that is being shown here. Uh, the temperature is high, and therefore the magnitude of this entropy term is greater than the magnitude of this enthalpy term, so that if you add these two together, you get the Gibbs free energy of mixing. And you can see that the entropy term is dominant because the Gibbs free energy of mixing is always negative, and it has just a single minimum here, which says that full mixing is um, favorable at this particular temperature. 
So at high temperatures, the entropy term always wins. Um, but what happens if we take this temperature and we gradually lower it? If we lower the temperature, then this entropy curve here is going up, 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 and up. And it soon becomes of a similar order of magnitude as the enthalpy curve. And that means that the Gibbs free energy of mixing now has um, a tougher competition between the enthalpy of mixing and the entropy of mixing. And if you if you make the temperature low enough, at some point, this single minimum that we used to have, the single minimum of the Gibbs free energy actually splits into two separate minima. And the reason that happens is because of the difference in shape between the enthalpy of mixing here, which is just alpha times C times one minus C, and then the entropy of mixing, which is based on a C log C um, plus one minus C times log of one minus C formula. Um, so that single minimum here splits into two minima. And what does this mean? Let's consider if we were at this temperature here, T equals T1, and we've got our enthalpy of mixing, which is endothermic, so this is positive. Enthalpy says, I don't want to mix, but the entropy term always says, I do want to mix. And if we add these two together, we get the Gibbs free energy of mixing, which is shown here. Now let's consider what if we have a, um, a case where it's C equals one half. So if you've got exactly the same number of A atoms as B atoms, if we're at the C equals one half, the Gibbs free energy of the fully mixed solution would be on the solid line here that shows how the Gibbs free energy is changing upon mix mixing. So the Gibbs free energy of the fully mixed solution would be here uh, on this line. Is that the lowest Gibbs free energy that the system can attain? The answer is no, because there's not a minimum here. The two minima are off to the side. There's a minimum here that corresponds to this lowercase a. Um, this has the first minimum here, g sub a. And then there's a second minimum on the other side that corresponds to this lowercase b. And that has this um, second minimum of Gibbs free energy, g sub b. And if you're at this one half um, concentration right between the two, the fully mixed case is not the minimum of Gibbs free energy. The minimum of Gibbs free energy occurs on this tie line connecting the little a phase and the little b phase. In other words, the minimum of free energy occurs if the system phase separates into one phase that corresponds to this little a composition, and then the other phase that corresponds to the little b composition. And this tie line here that connects the little a and the little b gives you the minimum and gives free energy by phase separating into the little a phase and the little b phase. So in other words, the fully mixed mixture here um, has a higher gives free energy shown by the solid line compared to the phase separated case if you come down here to the dashed line, this tie line that connects the two minima. What this means is that any composition that falls between these two minima, any composition that falls between the little a and the little b can minimize its Gibbs free energy by being along this tie line rather than having a fully mixed solution here on the solid line. And so anything that's between the little a and the little b is going to favor phase separation into one phase that's little a and the other phase that's little b. Um, anything that is outside of that range, so anything that is greater than b to the right of b here, this would, would favor a complete solution because you see you're outside of this tie line range. So here the minimum of Gibbs free energy is actually the solid line where you get a complete mixture of the two. So any concentration of um, that's greater than B here, or on the other side, any concentration here that's less than this little a would favor a complete mixture. So in other words, if you were between the little a and the little b, some phase separation is favored where the system will phase separate into the little a phase and the little, the little b phase. If you were outside of that range, then the minimum Gibbs free energy occurs with a complete mixture.
Now, that was at one particular temperature, T1. If we take the location of those minima at T1, um, you can see that one of the minima is at this little um, B composition. The other minimum here on the other side is at this little A composition. And so those two points of those two minima form two points on this dome, this so-called immiscibility dome. And if you were to increase the temperature, as you increase the temperature of the system, those two minima here are going to become closer and closer together until eventually entropy becomes completely dominant. When entropy becomes completely dominant, those two minima are going to uh, converge into a single minimum. And when that happens, that temperature is called T sub C, which is known as the critical temperature or the upper consulate temperature. And this is the temperature where the entropy is completely dominant. So any temperature that is at Tc or above Tc favors a single phase homogeneous system. So complete mixture at the atomic level, because any temperature that's greater than this is completely dominated by entropy. Any temperature that is less than Tc has this competition between enthalpy and, and entropy where some degree of phase separation is favored. So any temperature below Tc, if you fall within this emissibility dome, then the system is going to phase separate into the two phases uh, at the left and the right-hand intersections of that emissibility dome. So at this temperature T sub one, those intersections occur at this um, phase little b and the phase little a. As you lower the temperature, the width of the dome becomes broader and broader. And so that changes the, um, the compositions of the two phases, which will become further and further apart. So this emissibility dome here uh, defines the region of emissibility. Within this dome, this is where phase separation is favored. And if you were outside of the dome, either you're at a temperature above Tc, or you're in one of these regions here just outside of the dome, even below Tc, here on the right, or here on the left, in either of those cases, um, a complete mixture is favored. So if you're inside the dome, the system is immiscible uh, to some degree. If you are outside the dome, the system is miscible, meaning it can be completely mixed. Now, within this immiscibility dome, there is a second dome, which is given by the dash line here, and this is called the spinodal dome. Um, and what this is indicating is actually two different types of phase separation that can occur. And we're going to see um, how those different types of phase separation occur. What are the thermodynamic conditions for getting one type here versus the other type? Um, within the spinodal dome, within this inner dome, there is a, a type of phase separation called spinodal decomposition. On the other hand, if you are inside the immiscibility dome, but outside, the spinodal dome, you get the second type of phase separation, which is called droplet nucleation and growth. And the difference between um, these two domes uh, relates to uh, the shape of the Gibbs free energy function. So here I've got plotted the Gibbs free energy at our temperature T1. This is as a function of concentration here. And the two minima in the Gibbs free energy occur at this little a composition and over here at the little b composition. So if you follow this up, you can see that the bounds of the immiscibility dome occur at this little b composition here and at the little a composition here. Now, if we take the first derivative of the Gibbs free energy uh, with respect to concentration, that is just taking the first derivative of this curve and that gives us um, this shape shown here, where you can see it crosses through zero at the minimum here at A, and then on the right-hand side, it crosses through zero again through this point, little b. Um, the difference between the two domes, however, relates to the second derivative with respect to concentration. So now if we take the derivative again, that will give us the second derivative of the Gibbs free energy with respect to concentration. This is the curvature of the Gibbs free energy function, and that's shown here. And what you'll see is that the curvature 
goes through zero at two points, which are labeled D and E. The second derivative is zero, where the curvature goes to zero. And if you follow this back up to the Gibbs free energy function, the second derivative is zero, where the curvature is zero. So these are inflection points on the Gibbs free energy function. One of the inflection points is at this point D, shown here, and the other inflection point is at this point E, shown here. Now, if you follow these inflection points all the way up, those inflection points actually give the bounds of the spinodal dome, which falls within the immiscibility dome. So if you map out um, all of those inflection points, which at this temperature T1 occur at little d and little e, um, here, where the uh, second derivative goes to zero, that forms the bounds of this spinodal dome. So the difference between being inside the spinodal dome or outside of the spinodal dome relates to the sign of the second derivative. If you are within the spinodal dome here, between the points D and E, within that spinodal dome, the curvature is negative. You can see the negative curvature in the Gibbs free energy function. And if you follow that down to the second derivative, indeed, you can see it has a negative second derivative. In other words, a negative curvature um, within the spinodal dome. On the other hand, if you are within the immiscibility dome, but outside of the spinodal dome, so either between E and B or between A and D, in either of those regions, you can see that the curvature here is positive. And indeed, if you follow this down to the second derivative curve, you can see that the second derivative here is positive. So the spinodal dome corresponds to a negative second derivative, whereas being in the immiscibility dome but outside the spinodal dome corresponds to a positive second derivative. Now, why does this matter? This matters because it affects the stability of the phases with respect to small fluctuations in concentrations. So if you consider uh, the Gibbs free energy of some, say, local region in the system, and it has an average concentration here of C. So this is the average concentration C within the angle brackets. And now we've got some random thermal fluctuations. Those random fluctuations lead to random fluctuations in the local concentration. Um, this fluctuation is given by delta C. This delta C could be positive, it could be negative, it's just little fluctuations that occur. Um, now the question becomes, what is the Gibbs free energy um, as a result of that fluctuation? We can express that as a Taylor series expansion of the Gibbs free energy function starting at the average concentration. So this is the Gibbs free energy of the average concentration here, C. With the Taylor series approximation, we add the fluctuation here, delta C, times the first derivative of the Gibbs free energy function with respect to C. Then we add one half times the fluctuation squared times the second derivative plus and then there would be one sixth fluctuation cubed, third derivative, and so on. And we're gonna truncate this after the second derivative term. And now we know that the, um, that the, the fluctuation and concentration could be either positive or negative. And so on average, um, the average fluctuation here would actually be zero. And so this um, first order term, this linear term um, is going to average out to zero because this delta C is just as equally likely to be positive as it is to be negative. So this term goes away. However, if we look at the second derivative term, this has a fluctuation squared in it. And so this term is always going to be positive, regardless of, or this factor is always positive, regardless of whether the delta C is positive or negative. When you square it, this gives a positive number. And so this doesn't cancel out. In fact, this second derivative term is the dominant term that tells us how the Gibbs free energy is changing as a result of this fluctuation. And the sign of the change to Gibbs free energy then is determined by the sign of this second derivative. Um, and what this means is that the stability of that phase with respect to a localized fluctuation deter is determined by the sign of the second derivative of the Gibbs free energy with respect to that concentration. If the sign of, of the second derivative is positive, 
that means that the phase is locally stable with respect to that fluctuation because the fluctuation would lead to an increase of the Gibbs free energy. A positive number times the positive curvature here would mean that the Gibbs free energy would always go up with respect to a localized fluctuation. And this means that the system is uh, locally stable with respect to a fluctuation. This is what gives rise to one type of phase separation known as droplet nucleation and growth. Now, the other possibility is that the sign of the second derivative is negative. If that's the case, then this entire term becomes negative, which means that any fluctuation would result in a decrease of the Gibbs free energy of the system, which is thermodynamically favorable. What that means in the case of a negative curvature is that the fluctuation is going to lower the Gibbs free energy of the system. It's going to um, move to some to a state that is more thermodynamically favorable. And that means if the sign of this curvature is negative, that the, locally the system is um, unstable with respect to that fluctuation. It's going to change its uh, microstructure in response to that fluctuation. And that negative curvature therefore gives spinodal decomposition. So if we're inside the spinodal dome, that's where the curvature is negative. That's where the system is unstable with respect to localized fluctuations. And that leads to a certain type of microstructure called spinodal decomposition. On the other hand, if you're within the immiscibility dome, but outside of the spinodal dome, then the curvature is positive. That means the system is locally stable with respect to fluctuations. And that gives this other type of microstructure called droplet nucleation and growth. And droplet nucleation growth looks like this. This is a micrograph that was taken by my postdoc, uh, Nicholas Clark. And this is for a calcium aluminosilicate liquid uh, that has a matrix phase here, which is the dark phase in the background. The matrix phase forms the majority of the concentration of the system. And within that matrix phase, you've got these uh, droplets that form. Uh, those are the, the light circles shown here. You can see that they are largely spherical in shape, that they are a minority phase. So they are the, the less populous phase here. Um, you can see that they are largely disconnected from each other. So the only continuous phase here is the matrix phase. Um, you can also see that there's always sharp boundaries between the droplets and the matrix phase. On the other hand, if you are within the spinodal dome, um, there you've got um, two phases that are rather similar in terms of concentration. And spinodal decomposition looks like this micrograph shown here, where you've got two phases here, the dark phase and the light phase. Uh, both of them have this kind of worm-like morphology to them. Um, these are forming two interpenetrating networks um, that form kind of like mazes where there's always some path where you could follow any one of the phases from one side of the system to the other side. So if you were trying to get from the, the bottom to the top here, you could take, you could find a path either along the lighter phase or along the darker phase. And because these are fully interpenetrating, fully connected networks, um, you can follow a path through either one of them. So for the case of spinodal decomposition, the concentrations between these two phases are similar to each other. There's not like one phase that's dominant over the other phase. And uh, the morphology is kind of more like worm-like as opposed to spheres in a matrix. Now, if we look at kind of a qualitative picture of the kinetics of phase separation, uh, on the left-hand side, we've got uh, droplet nucleation. And on the right hand side, we have spinodal decomposition. And time is increasing in the downward direction here. So at the top, the top figures show the initial case of fully mixed systems. And then as we increase time, we're going downward and phase separation is evolving. If we start first with spinodal decomposition, here, if we've got our fully mixed composition here, and it's a composition of M, you'll see that this, in the spinodal case, the M here is falling um, about equidistant between the A phase and the B phase. So it's you know, roughly an equal concentration of the A phase versus the B phase. And this is locally unstable with respect to small fluctuations and concentrations. 
So the small fluctuations are going to lead to the gradual development of these spinoval phases as they separate from each other. So some of the B atoms here are going to uh, diffuse into regions that get enriched in B, and then what's left behind are regions that are depleted in B or enriched in A. And you can see that there's very diffuse boundaries between these phases, and over time, more and more of the B will diffuse from uh, one of the phases into the other phase, and this uh, the boundaries continue to be diffuse, but they, they sharpen up over time, and it's not until the microstructure is fully evolved and we've reached equilibrium that you have sharp boundaries between the two different phases. On the other hand, with droplet nucleation on the left, we're starting off with some composition here that's a lot closer to one of the phases than the other one. In this case, this composition here, M, is a lot closer to the A phase, which means there's a lot more of the A phase compared to the B phase. And what this means is that the A phase becomes the matrix phase, and the B phase becomes the droplet phase, because there's a lot more of A that needs to be the matrix phase. There's a lot less of B that needs to be um, the droplet phase. On the other hand, if this M were a lot closer to the B phase, then the opposite would be true, and B would be the matrix, and A would be the droplet. Now, the way that droplet nucleation evolves is that um, an initial droplet will nucleate, a very small spherical droplet will nucleate, and the concentration of that droplet is the final concentration of the B phase. You'll see here um, the droplet, it's a small width, but the concentration is um, equal to the final concentration of the B phase. And this is forming by diffusion of, of B atoms across this boundary and into the droplet itself. The other thing you'll note is that there's always a very sharp interface between the droplet phase and the matrix phase. Um, and this sharp interface is always well-defined. Uh, and over time, as more of the B diffuses from the matrix, crosses that boundary into the droplet, the droplets become bigger. So you can see the width evolving here until the matrix phase fully reaches its desired little a composition here. When that happens, the evolution of the microstructure has stopped and it's reached equilibrium. So in comparing these two different phase separation mechanisms with droplet nucleation and growth, the second phase here, the droplet phase, um, does not change composition with time. It's always the same um, composition at a given temperature. The interface between the droplet phase and the matrix phase is always sharp throughout all stages of growth. There's a tendency for random distributions of droplet sizes and positions within the matrix, and there's very low connectivity between the droplet phases. The only real connectivity is in the matrix phase. On the other hand, with spinoval decomposition, um, here there's a continuous variation of both extremes in composition with time until equilibrium compositions are reached. There is initially a very diffuse boundary between the phase and it becomes sharper over time. Uh, there's also a, more of a regularity of the distribution of size and position of the two different phases in spinoval decomposition. And there's a tendency for um, highly non-spherical, like tubular worm-like type of morphologies with a high degree of connectivity of both phases. Now, phase separation can lead to some very interesting behaviors. And what I want to show you is an example in a barium borosilicate ternary system where phase separation can occur in different forms depending upon what temperature that you're at. And uh, let me show you an example here with this microstructure shown on the left, where if you've got um, say this is our immiscibility dome for this system. If you start off it with a high temperature melt uh, that is above the TC, so above the critical temperature or upper consulate temperature, then the fully homogeneous system is favored here. But as the system is cooled down, when it crosses this immiscibility dome, then phase separation wants to occur. And in this case, it's favoring uh, phase separation by droplet nucleation, where the matrix phase here at this temperature T1, the matrix phase is the one that you're closer to. So this would be over here on the right. And then the droplet phase is over here on the left. 
And that is this first degree of phase separation where there's a matrix here, and then this big droplet in the lower part of the figure. But what happens if we continue to cool the system? If you take this matrix here and you cool it down, then all of a sudden the concentration of that matrix is within the emissibility dome because when you lowered the temperature, it increased the breadth of this emissibility dome. So the matrix here that was once thermodynamically stable because we changed the temperature, it's now out of equilibrium again, and this will want to phase separate again into a new matrix here labeled M2 and a new droplet phase. And that's what you can see in this micrograph that the matrix here has phase separated again into droplets within that matrix. On the other hand, if you look at the droplet phase itself, that droplet phase also falls within the emissibility dome again when it's cooled down. And this droplet will want to phase separate into a matrix phase and a droplet. And that's what's being shown here is that this big droplet phase separates again into these medium-sized droplets and a matrix phase. Now, if you take those medium-sized droplets, cool it down again, it falls within the emissibility dome again, and it will phase separate into a matrix phase and another droplet phase. And you can see within these droplets, there's more droplets. So we've got small droplets, inside medium droplets, inside large droplets, uh, all because as the system is progressively cooled, the targets for phase separation are changing because as the system is cooled, um, the breadth of the emissibility dome becomes greater and greater. So you can get all kinds of interesting microstructures here depending upon um, the nature of the emissibility dome and how much time that you spend at um, different temperatures. If you continue to cool the system down, um, eventually what shuts off any further development of the microstructure is that the kinetics become so, so slow at low temperatures. So speaking of the kinetics, let's now get to a quantitative description of the kinetics of phase separation. And what we're going to do now in this latter part of the lecture is to derive the kahn hilliard equation, which is the governing equation for the kinetics of phase separation. Now, the kahn hilliard equation can also be thought of as a generalization of fixed laws of diffusion, where instead of just having the concentration gradient as the thermodynamic driving force for diffusion, we consider both the enthalpic and the entropic contributions to, um, to the overall free energy. So Fick, in developing his equations, considered only the concentration gradient as the thermodynamic driving force for diffusion. And therefore, in Fickian diffusion, it can only happen um, down a concentration gradient. It can never create or enhance a concentration gradient. And that's because Fickian diffusion does not consider um, changes in bond energies as a result of mixing or demixing. And with the kahn hilliard equation, we are accounting for that contribution um, by having two different terms. And so this particular derivation of the kahn hilliard equation is uh, considering the Helmholtz free energy, in other words, at a constant volume V, where this Helmholtz free energy F is equal to an integral over this constant volume V, where there are two different terms in that integral. There is the free energy of the homogeneous system. So this is the free energy density here. That's just a function of the concentration C. And then there's a second term that depends on the gradient of the concentration. So in other words, if you have a change of the concentration, a spatial gradient here, that is gonna contribute something to the free energy and that's included in this second term. Now the sign of that contribution depends on this quantity here, kappa. Kappa is called the gradient energy coefficient. This could be positive if there is a free energy penalty with having um, a concentration gradient, or it could be negative if it's thermodynamically favorable to have a concentration gradient. So this coefficient here, kappa, is called the gradient energy coefficient, and this entire term here, the kappa over 2 times the gradient of C squared, this is called the inhomogeneous contribution to free energy, or simply the gradient energy.
So we've got the homogeneous contribution here on the left and the inhomogeneous contribution or the gradient energy on the right. Now, the mathematics of deriving the kahn hilliard equation involves um, using uh, variational calculus. And this is a class that maybe you had and maybe you didn't have. I think most um, graduate students in material science and engineering have not taken um, a math class in uh, variational calculus, and that's okay. We're just going to use one result, which is called the variational derivative, also known as the functional derivative. And this uses um, something mathematically, which is called a functional. A functional is just a function of a function. And if you have some sort of functional here, y, see this is a function of a function. Um, and if this y functional has this particular form where y is, is described by the integral of some integrand function i, and that integrand function i is a functional of, it's a function of x, variable x, a functional of the function y of x. So i is a function of y, which is a function of x, and i is also a function of x, and i is also a function of the derivative of y with respect to x. And all of that gets integrated over x. So we have this particular mathematical setup. Um, through the calculus of variations, um, the variational derivative is given by the following formula, where some change of this original functional y with respect to the function lowercase y. So this uh, delta of y with respect to um, the change of the function y of x is given by the partial of the integrand with respect to that function minus then the x derivative of the partial of i with respect to um, the derivative of y with respect to x. So this is a way to, to write how much the functional y is changing with respect to that function in terms of this uh, the changes of this integrand here. So this is the key result from variation of calculus that gets used to derive the kahn hilliard equation. And if we apply that to our um, functional, you see here we've got our um, Humboldt's free energy functional, and this depends on our homogeneous term here, our free energy, uh, which is a function of the concentration. And then we've got the second term, which is depending upon the derivative of the concentration. And it's integrated over the volume here of V. Applying that result from variational calculus to get the variational derivative, then the change of the Helmholtz free energy with respect to a change of the concentration is equal to the, the partial of this uh, free energy function with respect to concentration minus our kappa, times um, this second derivative, second spatial derivative with respect to concentration, or in other words, the Laplacian of the concentration. This is in writing it in three dimensions. If we do the same thing in one dimension x, it becomes the, the uh, change of the free energy f. I've dropped the v subscript here if it's just in one dimension instead of in three dimensions, so it's just f. Um, so this is the change of F with respect to concentration, and that's equal to the partial of this free energy function with respect to concentration, then minus this gradient term here. So minus the kappa times the second derivative of the concentration with respect to X. Note that this second derivative function is the same one that appeared when we were doing our Taylor series expansion, right? Because we wanted to see um, what the curvature was of of the um, Gibbs free energy function. So the, the second derivative is showing up again. Now, the change of free energy with respect to the concentration of the species can be written as a difference of the chemical potential between the two different phases. So for a homogeneous system, this becomes the difference of the chemical potential between the B phase and the A phase. However, what we're interested in is the inhomogeneous system, which has some sort of concentration gradients. And therefore, in this case, the change of the Helmholtz free energy with respect to some change of concentration would be equal to the difference of the chemical potentials in the inhomogeneous case, which is denoted here mu prime sub b minus mu prime 
sub a. And using our result from calculus of variations, we know that this difference in chemical potential for the inhomogeneous system is equal to the partial of this um, free energy with respect to concentration minus the kappa times the second derivative term. Now, the condition for equilibrium is when there's no more difference between the chemical potentials of the two different phases. So the condition for equilibrium is this mu prime A is equal to the mu prime B. If these two are equal to each other, then that means this difference here is zero. And if it's zero, then there's no thermodynamic driving force for the system to evolve. On the other hand, if these chemical potentials are different, that provides a thermodynamic driving force for this phase separation process to occur. So the system will continue to evolve its microstructure until the chemical potentials become equal to each other. At that point in time, there's no more thermodynamic driving force for microstructural evolution, and we will have stopped. So um, in coming up with the kahn hilliard equation, the first equation that we have here on the top is um, the analog to fix first law of diffusion. So it's the analog to the flux equation. So going back to um, chapter two, our chapter on irreversible thermodynamics, we know that the flux of some species is going to be equal to minus um, some kinetic coefficient here, L, times our thermodynamic driving force, which in this case is the gradient of the chemical potential difference between the two phases. Um, and then, then we just substitute in um, our formula here from variation of calculus for the change of the free energy with respect to concentration. So this term is the thermodynamic driving force, the L is the kinetic factor, and the minus sign here is because the, the flux is acting to lower the free energy of the system. In one dimension, we can express the same thing as shown on the right. Uh, instead of a gradient, this just becomes a partial derivative with respect to that one spatial dimension here, um, x. Now, um, following fix, the derivation of fixed second law, remember with fixed second law, we were using the conservation of mass and then applying fixed first law to derive fixed second law. If we follow those same steps, what we have is that the change of the concentration with respect to time is equal to minus uh, the derivative of the flux with respect to the spatial coordinates. So this is a statement that um, basically a change of the amount of the species with respect to time has to be in agreement with the change of the amount of species with respect to the spatial dimension. This is what we derived in chapter three. And then um, substituting in the equation here from the flux equation, so taking this JB, substituting that in here, then we get um, an analog to fix second law. So this analog to fix second law, which accounts for the full change of the Helmholtz free energy. So that gives us the partial with respect to X of our kinetic coefficient L times then the X derivative of this, um, this variational, this result from variational calculus. So the Delta F with respect to C. So if we put this all together, that final equation is the Kahn-Hilliard equation. The Kahn-Hilliard equation is the analog to fix second law that accounts for uh, a complete description of the free energy difference accounting for both the enthalpic factor as well as the entropic factor. And in one dimension, uh, the Kahn-Hilliard equation can be expressed as shown here up above. So applying our result from variational calculus that um, you know that imperfect uh, differential of the total free energy has this homogeneous contribution here, and then the inhomogeneous contribution in the second term. There's a spatial derivative of that multiplied by the kinetic factor, and then another spatial derivative. So this is the Kahn-Hilliard equation in one dimension. If the kinetic factor is a constant, it can be pulled out in front. Um, in three dimensions, the result is shown here. So this would be a divergence of the kinetic factor, which if it's a constant, again, comes out in front. Um, and then there's a gradient and a Laplacian operator here. If L is constant and comes out in front, then the divergence acts on the gradient and you get another Laplacian operator. So for a constant kinetic coefficient, the Kahn-Hilliard equation is the, that the partial of concentration with respect to time is equal to the kinetic coefficient times the Laplacian of 
this homogeneous term, which is how the how the free energy changes with respect to um, concentration, and then minus the inhomogeneous term that accounts for the changes of free energy with respect to um, concentration uh, gradients or specifically uh, curvatures. Now, um, one numerical implementation of that is shown on the right. And what you can see is if you solve the kahn hilliard equation on this two-dimensional grid, where the initial system is this complete mixture of the black phase and the white phase, and if phase separation is preferred, over time, you get the evolution of this microstructure. So this is just an implementation of the kahn hilliard equation for this two-dimensional case where you have an initial fully mixed system. And when you solve the kahn hilliard equation, it actually creates a concentration gradient where one didn't exist before. So from the point of view of Fickian diffusion, this would not happen because Fickian diffusion only eliminates concentration gradients. It doesn't create a new concentration gradient. But because of the differences of the enthalpy between the different types of bonding, um, demixing is actually preferred in this case. And so with the Hilliard equation, the system evolves to create a concentration gradient because it is enthalpically favored to do so. And that's what you see in this animation. Now, an example of using the kahn hilliard equation is with a numerical technique called the phase field method. Uh, phase field modeling are numerical models that implement the kahn hilliard equation together with any additional physics that is relevant for the problem. So if there's, say, imposition of magnetic fields or um, you know, a, a current or mechanical stress, whatever additional uh, forces are relevant are also applied and added to the terms in the equation. And then phase field modeling is um, dividing your system into uh, a grid and then solving for the evolution of the phases over time. For example, if you have this case that's shown here where there's one phase that's shown as the white phase, one phase that is the black phase. And if you take a cross section of this, um, the local state is described by this phase field variable, which is phi, where the number one corresponds to one of the phases, the white phase in this case, and the number zero corresponds to the other phase, the black phase. And so if you take a cut across here, you can see how this phase field variable is um, bouncing back between one and zero. And as it crosses the interface, the sharpness of that transition is describing the sharpness of the interface between those two phases. Um, an example, a really beautiful example of practical um, implementation of the phase field modeling was done by my colleague here at Penn State, Professor Long Ching Chen, who is the world's leading expert in phase field modeling. And um, you know, one of the most brilliant uh, minds in thermodynamics working today. And this is the case of, um, he was trying to develop a material that had a high degree of piezoelectricity while also being optically transparent. And the traditional way of attempting to make these materials was um, evolving a microstructure under a DC field, which resulted in the phase field modeling predicting the microstructure that looks like this in the upper right. Uh, when the experimentalist made the material and characterized it with SEM, you can see that the shapes of the various phases here agreed with the shapes that were predicted from uh, the model. But what he discovered is if instead of using a DC field, if you apply an AC field, you can get this nice alignment of the various faces from the model. And indeed, applying this prediction from the model to an actual experiment, you can see that that alignment actually occurs in experiment as well. And if we look optically at these materials, the DC pulled cases are shown on the right, but you can see that there is a lot of haziness there. Uh, whereas the AC pulled phases actually achieve the desired optical transparency. So this is a, a beautiful example of applying the phase field method, applying everything that we've learned in this chapter toward the design of new materials and being able to uh, predict the um, microstructure process property relationships from modeling and then bring that into practice from experiment. So to summarize, Systems that are initially homogeneous 
can phase separate if that demixing will lower the free energy of the system. Liquid-liquid uh, phase separation can occur by two different mechanisms, droplet nucleation or spinodal decomposition, depending upon uh, if the sign of the second derivative of the Gibbs free energy with respect to concentration is positive or negative. Um, the kinetics of the phase separation are described by the kahn hilliard equation that we derived with variational calculus. So thank you for listening. Next time we will deal with nucleation and crystallization. So basically, how do we grow, how do we nucleate and grow crystals? All right. Thank you so much, everyone.